sorry. First Chronicles 29. Are you there yet? No. <laughs> First Chronicles 29. First Chronicles 29. I have the opportunity to receive the offering, tithes and offering this this uh, this evening. And uh, but before I do so, I want to acknowledge the pastors and the ministers that are here. Okay, this is Pastor Tim right here. In case uh, you you don't know him, Pastor Tim, uh, uh, Pastor Tim is um, in Monrovia. And uh, give us a name. Uh, stand up and give us the name of your church and, and where you're at and, and that type of thing. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Over over here, the young lady in the with the uh, beautiful long blonde hair. Okay, that's uh, Pastor Judy. Pastor Judy, why don't you stand up and uh, just shout to everybody where you're from. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? You know, they got a, they got a service on, sa on Saturday night in Espanol and on Sunday morning in English. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. You know, and I thought, I thought, for the first time I heard of it, I thought, I, I use Spanos in Cambria? Yeah. You know what that means? There's Hispanics in Cambria, and I found, yeah, yeah, qu quite a bit. Quite a bit, because it's a tourist city. And uh, if you've never been there, it's beautiful, beautiful. And next to them is Gil and Kathy Rendon. They're, they're, uh, they're the uh, associates, right-hand people, you know, to, uh, to Pastor Judy. And uh, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody else, you know, except my wife. My wife is back there, too, and uh, my sweetheart, you know. It's been, it's been uh, going to be 44 years this year. Praise God. Praise God. Am I forgetting somebody else? Oh, <coughs> I got your brochure right here, brother. <laughs> okay, this is Peter and Donna. And if you can pronounce their last name, I'll give you a free book. Ah, uh -huh, no, no, you don't count. You don't count. <laughs> you, know, you know. Stand up and, and greet everybody and tell us where you're, where, where you're from. Praise God. They, they get the price for coming the longest. The longest, the furthest, whatever you want to call it. And they have, a, they have a brochure back there, okay? Pick one up. You know, pick one up, you know? And uh, that way you can remember to pray for them. Can you say amen? Praise God. Back there, also before we receive tithes and offerings, you know, is, uh, is my book. Okay? Amazing love. Okay? And... Uh, some of you have already gotten it, but it's back there also. Uh, Patricia, Patricia, I forgot to introduce Patricia. Patricia, why don't you stand up, you know, and uh, introduce yourself. Amen, amen, amen. These are, these, are, these are scripture cards, okay? I, I've been associated with Patricia since uh, way back, I think, 84, 85, something like that, you know. Well, but, but when we started working together in the, in the ministry, I think it was 84, 85, and, uh, and uh, for example, this one right here, this, this, this is a, a, a set of scripture cards. It's on healing. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, you need to, re you know, you need to read healing scriptures every day. I, I learned that from Brother Hagen. Who's he? You don't know who Brother Hagen is? My goodness gracious, you know. You know, you better find out, you know. But I learned that from Brother Hagen. Read healing scriptures every day. Well, Pastor Samuel, are you well? Yeah, and I want to stay well. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's why I get on my bike almost every single day, and that's why I read my healing scriptures every day. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God, you know. And there, there are several different topics, okay. This one is our... Prosperidad. Anybody know prosperidad? Prosperity. You know, so they're, they also have them in Spanish. Okay? And, and, uh, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is your latest book, right, uh, Patricia? This is, her, this is her latest book, Healing is Yours. Okay? You know, I, 
I have, I have these cards. By the way, I have these cards on my desk. And when I'm mailing a letter out to a, to a brother or sister, you know, I always tuck in a card. I tuck in a card. You know, I look, I look around, you know, and if, if I find a scripture card that says, repent. I'm, no, I, no I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I say, no, I'll go to the next card. I go, no, 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 I'm just kidding. The cards don't say that. The cards don't say that. Repent, you workers of iniquity. I said, no, I don't think I better send that to, uh, to, to my aunt. You know? <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I think, I think that's all the announcements. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock, ministers only. You know what that means? It means you're all invited. Amen. Amen. You're all invited. You know? Well, I, I, I'm the janitor in the church, Pastor Samuel. You're in ministry. You're in ministry. Amen. You're in ministry. First Chronicles chapter 29. This is one of the most beautiful offerings in the Bible. And uh, when you have some time, you can read the entire chapter. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to take time to read the entire chapter. But it is, it is David receiving an offering. And look what Brother David says. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10. Okay? 1 Chronicles 29, 10. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly and said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom of God, O Lord, rather, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Isn't this beautiful? And they're receiving an offering. They're receiving an offering. You've heard it said many times that the offering is a time of worship. It's not a time of, oh, well, I got to give now. No, you don't got to do anything. You get to. Amen? Amen? When my son was 10 years old, he says, do I have to go take a shower? And I said, no, you get to, son. You get to. Amen? Do I have to tithe? I get to tithe. Do I have to give offerings? I, you know, I have to. No, I get to. I get to. Back in the Old Testament, they had to. I'm now under the, oh, the new covenant. Now I do it out of my heart. Out of my heart. And, 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 yet, and yet David, even though David was, was living under the old covenant, he had learned the principles of new covenant giving. New covenant giving is giving out of your heart. Glory to God. Not because you have to. I've told, I've told husbands, don't. You want to get in trouble with your wife? Bring her flowers because, and tell her, honey, well, I'm supposed to bring you flowers, so here you go. No, no. Ed, 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 you're going to sleep outside. <laughs> you're going to sleep outside, you know. We do it because we want to. Look at, look at the next verse. Look at the next verse, okay? Verse 13. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly as this. For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. Of your own we have given you. Isn't that a beautiful statement? We're just giving you, Heavenly Father, of what you've given to us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me wrap up here. Verse 15, verse 16. Oh, Lord, our God. All this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house is for your holy name. Uh, for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. That which we're giving unto you is of what you have given to us. And that's a beautiful thing to acknowledge and to remember. When we come to church and we bring our tithes or we bring our offerings, we're only giving to him of what he has given to us. And you, know, and you know why? You know, if you read the verses from verse 1 to, to verse 9, David, David, I heard it say that David brought more than a billion dollars in offering during this time. 
And, and, he, and he goes on to explain how many talents of gold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when David gave, it, 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 it uh, motivated the leaders to give. And as I was reading the scripture, I recognized something here. The people were giving freely because they recognized that our God is a generous God. Amen. Amen. You know, it says, it says in the book of Philippians 4.19, you know, the scripture says, but my God shall supply all your needs according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In the Amplified Bible, it says, but my God will liberally supply. Liberally supply. You know, and as I was listening to one of those songs, it says, your grace is enough. Grace is more than enough. Grace is mucho mas, it says in the Spanish Bible. Much more, mucho mas. Our God is the God of the much more. You know, and he has... And it says in 1 Timothy that he has freely given us all things. He's freely given us everything. So when we come and we gather, we say, Father, what would you have me to give? And then we obey because he is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen. Are we ready to receive tithes and offerings? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, make your checks out to lost and found. Don't put found and lost. Okay, lost and found. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you need a tight envelope or an offering envelope, raise your right hand. Don't raise up your left hand. I said right hand. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And then that brother, remember that minister said, don't. Don't write your, your, your offering in tongues. <laughs> couldn't read, couldn't read. The secretary says, the secretary says, well, is that 100 or 1,000? 1,000. Amen. <laughs> that's what I said. That looks like 1,000 to me. I don't think that's like 100. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, they don't have a song, so I think I'll, I'll sing a little song to you. It goes like this. It goes like this. I'm living in the land of milk and honey. Living in the land of milk and honey. Remember that? That's what the Lord said to the, to the Israelis. Living in the land of milk and honey. There's more than enough to go around. Amen. My God meets all of my needs. According to his riches and glory, all grace is abounding toward me. I have all sufficiency. The windows of heaven are open unto me. I have given and it's given unto me. Because I'm living in the land of milk and honey. 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 Well, never, ever, ever run dry. Come join me in the land of milk and honey. Join me in the land of milk and honey. Join me in the land of milk and honey. There's more than enough to go around. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Our God never runs out. Are you ready to receive the word? Amen. I want you to stand up. First of all, because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, I believe, therefore have I spoken. I believe, therefore have I spoken. And I want you to speak the word of God over your offering. I believe, therefore, have I spoken? Paul said, we believe, therefore, we speak. We speak. We speak. Praise God. I don't, I, you know, it doesn't matter whether it was an offering or whether it's a, a, a tie that you brought here this, 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 uh, this evening. But I want you to say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, have abundance, I have abundance. And there is no lack. Is no lack. The windows of heaven are open unto me. The good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over blessing, is mine. And the hundredfold return is working for me all the time. Thank you, Father. Money comes to me through unexpected channels every day. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now don't sit down. Don't sit down because I want you to receive my pastor. 
you know, who is the national director of Faith Christian Fellowship, the organization that, that I and Pastor Elias and Trish are affiliated with, and also Peter and Donna with a long last name, okay? And uh, the Rendons, the Rendons and, and uh, Sister um, and Pastor Judy. And, uh, you know, it's an organization that one of the visions of FCF is to help you accomplish the vision that God has placed in your heart. And you know what? Everybody's got a vision. As a pastor, I've got a vision. But you know what? I need, Pastor Lonnie, I need other ministers around me to help me. I, I, not, I not only need my wife and the people in my church, but I need other ministers. I need to be part of a family that helps me accomplish the vision God has placed in my heart. You know, and Brother Lonnie, I was telling Brother Lonnie, I said, Brother Lonnie, man, I can remember 2001 when I became the pastor of the church overnight. It's a long story. I became the pastor of the church overnight. And I got on the phone. I, I, I said, Pastor Lonnie, I can remember where I was. I can remember. I can remember. I was in the city of San Gabriel under a tree. And I'm calling Brother Lonnie. And, I, and I'm saying, and I'm saying this, this very spiritual prayer. Help! <laughs> I, 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 I need help. And Brother Lonnie started guiding me. and said, well, you need to do this. You need to do that. Thank you, Father. You know, I want you to welcome my pastor, the National Director for Faith Christian Fellowship, Lonnie Hilton. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, smile on the way down, if you would. I, I want to correct something Brother Samuel said then, though. He said that I told him what to do. I don't tell people what to do. I give things to them to consider, to pray through, and then to follow the Spirit of God. How many know we're all supposed to be led by the Spirit of God? Amen? Amen. Those are the sons of God to be led by the Spirit of God. Praise God. It's good to be with you tonight, and I just trust you've had a good day. I believe we're going to have a good night together. Uh, I've had such a, a time standing over here. I've thought on, I come prepared with a particular message, and I felt like the Lord changed it once, and he changed it twice, and 30 times. And finally, I said, Lord, I do, not, I do not receive a spirit of confusion. Amen. Amen. <laughs> So I believe that the Lord will have his way here tonight. But we do welcome you on behalf of all of your family of FCF around the world. You can't go to sleep of a night without someone, even in Kenya, another part of the world that's ministering the Word of God. FCF is only one family within the family of God. And I'm so glad that if you're here tonight and you're not part of FCF, hey, guess what? We're still part of the family, aren't we? Because I found out there's only one family. Jesus is still the head. Amen. And therefore, we're brothers and sisters, and we just love you so much, and we're here to help you. And if anything we can say or do to help you, that's our heartbeat. Uh, I had a wonderful time with Pastor Elias today, just fellowshipping with him, and uh, we did finally eat something. <laughs> the waitress came by, I think, four times before we stopped talking long enough to take an order, which was rather humorous. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, another thing I do want to say, some of you are aware of it, uh, those of you in FCF in particular, in, in August of last year, my son passed away. He was 40 years of age, and a lot of you are praying for us, and we appreciate your prayers. It really brought strength. And let me just say this. If you ever hear a message about the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it's more than a message. It's a reality. The comfort of the Holy Ghost came upon us there in that receiving line as we were giving honor to our son, a fireman, and to watch all of the hundreds of people that walked through there for hours, and then the two-mile-long prayer uh, down the highway with the police and the fire trucks leading us as we want to put him in his grave. But let me just make a couple comments I, uh, about that. At the day of the funeral, I had to share some things. I wasn't going to do the funeral, but I talked to his pastor, and I says, will you do me a favor? And he says, what's that? I said, will you be evangelistic? And he says, well, yes, I always am. I said, good. So I got up and I shared a little bit about my son, and because I heard so many good words from so many people, and his lieutenant shared for about half hour before I, my daughter shared a few things, and I did, and the pastor ministered. But in that time, we heard so many good things about my son, and I, I was able to share this. The reason why we could share those good things about my son, Jeff, 
was because when he was a little boy, we came home from church, and we sat on the sofa, and he sat there next to me, his little legs stuck straight out in front of me. He had such a serious look on his face. I said, son, what's wrong? And he, he looked up and said, Brett, he, uh, he accepted Jesus today. I said, praise God. Would you like to? He says, no. And he just sat there like that. And so I just sat there a little bit, and finally he looked up and says, Dad, I want to. I said, I have one question, son, because I wanted to make sure he wasn't doing something just because his friends were doing it. I said, what did Jesus do for you? And this little, he was only four years old, but he said, Jesus died so I don't have to die. I led him to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then later he wanted me to go baptize him in his Scooby-Doo pool. <laughs> And so I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord that baptized him in a Scooby-Doo pool. Praise God. So anyway, uh, I rejoiced in my son. Someone said to me at the funeral, I couldn't believe they said it. I almost got in the flesh. Well, I almost got in their flesh. They said, God took your son. It says, no, God did not take my son. He received him in heaven. But he did not take his life. Hallelujah. How many of you know that God and the devil have never traded places? God's still a good God and the devil's still a bad devil. <laughs> I like to say it this way, there's no loser on planet earth been here longer than the devil. He's the oldest loser on planet earth. Got kicked out of heaven, glory to God. But we know what happens when the, a person is born again, where they go when they, their spirit leaves their body. Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we didn't lose our son, we know exactly where he's at, and I'm looking forward to the day I'll be able to join him. And I don't know about you, but I really believe it's getting closer, closer and closer day by day. Uh, if the Lord Jesus wouldn't come soon, I believe the world would implode, just turn in and crush on itself. Now then, you have a choice to make. Are you going to look at what's taking place in the world and get disheartened, depressed, down? Or are you going to rejoice as you look at the redemption drawn out? Are you going to lift up your head and rejoice like the Bible said? See, it even tells us that when sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. So how are we looking at it? Is the glass half full or half empty? Amen? We need to begin to rejoice, I think. So I, 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 I believe I've heard from God, and I want you to, if you would, turn to Romans, the 12th chapter. I want to share something with you tonight and try to help you uh, in being able to look at the Word of God with a holy reverence, with an appreciation, with an acceptance that it is the Word of God. People are being tempted right now not to believe that the Word of God was actually inspired by God. But my Bible tells me in 2 Timothy 3.16, tells me all Scripture, not part of the Scripture, but all Scripture was given by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable. Everybody's wanting to find profit in the world today. I tell you what, go to the Word of God and you're going to find the directions to profit in life. Amen. But it's profitable for all men. Uh, and, and so I go to the Word of God and I know this. All this scripture is inspired of God. It's profitable. What? For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Now, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says this, No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost has moved upon individuals since the beginning of time to pin down the Word and to protect it even today. That I don't care which translation you have, get the spirit of what the Word is saying to you. Amen. Somebody actually pulled me away when I was down in Mexico City, and they say, I'm very concerned because many of the churches are not using the King James Version. I said, huh? I almost got whiplash looking left at him. I says, what are you talking about? Well, we should be using it. Why? King James Version means exactly that. It's a version. It was a, it was a translation from the original script also. So don't ever get confused by that. It's good to read different translations because sometimes it helps bring out some of the truth because if you're reading the King James, there's a, a, that's a Elizabethan English can be sometimes hard to understand. And one translation, and I try to change translations every year. In reading the Bible, studying the Word, I try to change translations each year just so I can read it again. 
one thing is this. I don't know about you. I love to underline. Let me encourage you. You need to get a new Bible every year. You've got to be careful or you'll start reading your underlines. You know what I'm talking about? I open a chapter and I, all of a sudden, man, I've underlined this. And there's a whole lot of good stuff that you didn't underline. And you've got to watch that you don't just read your underlines. So every year I try to read through the Bible and I try to another translation each year. And I've been the last two years really appreciating the New Living Translation. And it is an excellent one. I really encourage you that you might get a hold of that. Amen. Well, listen, if you have your word tonight, I want you to turn to Romans, the 12th chapter. And what I want to talk about tonight is this. We all have this objective. We should have this objective that we all are being conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a part of the process of growing spiritually. Amen. And notice that word I use there. It's a process of being transformed and renewed in your mind. Okay? Let me say it this way. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. God so loved the church, he gave the Holy Spirit. We say to the world, you need to be born again. But we say to the church, you need to have your mind renewed. Because when you get born again, you still have that same stinking old mind. Amen or oh me? You are a new creature in Christ Jesus, but what's been recreated is the real you, your spirit. Because, you see, we are a triune being, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we're housed in a body. And when you're born again, your spirit is made new, but you still have that old mind. That's why we read here now in Romans 12, verse 2, Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? He says, thank you for asking. By the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, His pleasing and his perfect will. Heavenly Father, as I stand before you tonight, before these, your precious people, I pray that I will speak your word clearly. I pray that it will be accurate. It will be from your heart to their heart. That it will bring understanding and an illumination to them. That they will see the word of God in a, in a light that will cause your word to explode within them. That, Lord, they be conformed a little bit more tonight by your word. And I pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. The Bible tells us here that he said what? Don't be conformed or pressed into the mold of the world system, into thinking like the world. He said, but rather be transformed. How am I going to be transformed? By the renewing of your mind. You see, when I got born again, I, and, and I, my testimony isn't a testimony of all the things God delivered me from as much as the fact that how he kept me after I got born again. Because I was born again at the age of eight. I'm sorry, I've never been drunk. I've never been on drugs. Never got hooked on tobacco. I tried to smoke some wheat straw one time. Don't try it. It won't work. <laughs> it's hollow. I sucked the flame right into my mouth. I burnt my mouth so bad. I was out behind a barn. I'm a farm boy. And I had that wheat straw, and I lit that thing. Oh. My, it just burnt my mouth. I went in the house. Mom said, how are you doing? So I said, oh, I'm okay. And she said, what's wrong with you? I wouldn't tell her. But I thought, dear Lord, who would ever want to do that? But my testimony is I got saved when I was eight years of age, and the Lord kept me all of these years. And I just turned 66, so he's kept me a few of those years. Amen? So the Lord, his keeping power is my testimony. Praise God. And he, he, he let me marry my sweetheart from high school. We went through high school all the, for four years, and then we've been married 48 years this year. So we've been together now over 50 years. But the thing about it is this. God's keeping power has helped me. But when I got born again at the age of eight, some things that I had been trained and taught as a young boy was this. Everything was God's doing. I wasn't taught about a devil. I wasn't taught about an enemy of your faith. Anything that happened to anybody where I was taught, God did it, good or bad. So you can understand the stinking thinking I had in my head when I got born again. When my spirit was new, but guess what? I still had some old thinking. I had to get it changed. My image of God, he was an old man at the end of a hallway with gray hair, gray head, gray beard, and a ball bat. And he was just waiting for you to get out of line so he could womp you. 
That's the, the picture I had of God as a little boy. How many understand I needed to have my mind transformed? <laughs> Amen. I need to have a renewing of my mind. And there's only one way you'll have your mind renewed, not just by what people say, but what you find out is true in the Word of God. So, if you do not renew your mind, I can guarantee you right now, you're going to be the same person 30 years from now that you are today. We have a responsibility as an individual to renew our mind. Thank God for the church. Thank God for a pastor. Thank God so much that you stand and you preach the word and you lay a good foundation. But it's our responsibility to check out what's said and to line it up as it lines the word of God to receive that word and to cause our minds to have the washing of the water by the word to where we begin to transform in the way we are thinking. I'm so glad I no longer see my heavenly father as gray-headed with a ball bat. <laughs> He's my heavenly father, my Abba, my daddy. I love him much. Amen. But it takes the Word of God to renew your mind. And we have to renew our mind, which simply means exchanging your thoughts, your ways of thinking, for God's ways of thinking, the way He believes. But I've found this. People will rise to their level of satisfaction. Some people are just satisfied to getting born again and getting their fire insurance from hell. And they say, that's where I want to stay. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to get in the Word of God. Or some people say, well, I'll go to church, and they're faithful in church, but they're not faithful the rest of the week to be in God's presence and walk in the Word. And I'm not saying that to be legalistic. I'm saying that to bring your attention that if you're going to have your mind renewed, it's going to take an effort on your part. If we could lay hands on you and shake it in you, we'd do it. But it won't work that way, okay? You have to desire. The Bible says desire the sincere milk of the word. Desire it. There's something. If you want to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, it takes an effort on your part. Not just the minister that stands in front of you. I need to have some water. Amen. So people will rise to their level of satisfaction. Thank you so very much. Back home right now in Tulsa, <clears throat> they're having rain, changing to freezing rain, sleet, and turning to snow. It'll be seven degrees Sunday night. I like California, <laughs> even in the rain. <laughs> amen, amen. Praise God. So people will rise to the level of satisfaction. Well, what happens when a person's born again? When you're born again, your spirit's made new. Your spirit is as perfect as it's ever going to be. But your mind, it's a process of renewing your mind and maturing. Amen? Okay, help me out here. Pastor, would you come up here? Yeah. Brother Samuel, would you come up here? Uh, would you turn, turn this way? I'll, yeah. And uh, Samuel here. And Peter, would you come up here behind? I want you one right behind the other. Yes, that, that'd be fine. And you just stand behind him. Now, what I want to talk about right now is, well, let me read the scripture to you. It's found in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This is speaking about you as an individual and your entirety, okay? And it says, the very God of peace, sanctify, which means set apart, set apart you wholly, meaning entirely. And I will pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. So, I want this to illustrate, okay, spirit, soul, and body. You're a triune being, but you are working together to make the whole of a person. Every one of you, I'm looking at your body. But you have a soul, and the real you is the spirit inside you. Okay. Now, you're, you're, the body is simply the clothes of the soul and the spirit. It actually takes shape. Your, your spirit man looks like your physical body right now. Because you find that even in the Bible, when I think it was Luke 16th chapter, when the rich man died and the poor man died. And uh, remember they went down, the uh, rich man died and went down into hell. And the, uh, the beggar went up to the upper regions at that time. It existed. That place does not exist there now. But anyway, he went to the upper regions of hell. And there he was in Abraham's bosom. And he looked across, and these are their spirits, because their body's in the grave. 
but they recognize because their spirit looked like their physical body, okay? Now, I made a statement there. That place no longer exists. The upper regions, it doesn't because when Jesus ascended into heaven, he led those that are held captive into heaven. Now to die is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Okay. Didn't want to confuse you. But anyway, so here's, this, here's your body. Okay. No. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Spirit, soul, and body. Thank you for correcting me on that. Here's the body back here. Back here. Okay. Okay, so the body is the clothes for the spirit and the soul. Now, the spirit makes contact directly to God. The, the soulish area makes contact in the intellectual realm through the, the mind, the will, and the emotions. And the physical body contacts the material world through the five senses. Sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. That's how we've been put together. And it's, it's a system that works together. Now then, your spirit fellowships with God, it believes the Word of God right now. The problem is here. Not Brother Samuel, no. The soul. <laughs> the soul is the problem. Notice how even the Bible talks about your whole spirit, soul, and body. It's put in that sequence for a purpose because the soulish area of man is going to determine whether or not you're going to be led even by the spirit or by the senses, the flesh. We have to have our minds renewed to the word of God. Amen. Because if the mind has not been renewed, it will bear witness and get in agreement with the physical body. The physical body said, ouch, I don't feel good. I'm sick. And, and the soul says, yeah, oh, that's right, you, you're looking bad, man. You, you, yeah, you're sick, all right, you know. And, this, and what it does, it holds the spirit in captivity where it can't really lead this one person into its victory that God has prepared for him. But when the soulish area's mind is renewed, that when the body says, I'm sick, but the mind's been renewed, it says, no, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. God's word is true. Why would I confer with the body that can let me down when he who will never let me down said I'm healed? So when the mind is renewed and then it's agreement with the spirit, the body has nothing to do but go along with them because all it is is the carrier of these two. Amen. So the, the, the soulish area, mind, will, and emotions is where we in the body of Christ, especially in church, that's what we're trying to renew. That's why you study the word each day also is to renew your mind, to think more like God thinks. Revelation comes to you as you're in the word of God. And you can read some scriptures over and you can read them year after year and all of a sudden you read something and man, it'll just jump out at you. And revelation comes. And one particular scripture just a couple of weeks ago just jumped out at me. It's New Living Translation in 2 Corinthians 1, 9. And it's talking about death, but he made this statement. I've stopped relying on myself, and now I've started relying on God. Family, we have to get to this point where we're getting away from just the natural things. Because the Bible says that these things of the natural are temporal, which means subject to change. But the things that are eternal in spirit are, are there forever. So our mind needs to be renewed. So in the body, as we're walking this, this earth, our mind needs to be renewed daily. It needs to be renewed. Our body, it's the same old body. It's going to be the same old body until it's transformed when Jesus comes in a twinkling eye and it's going to put on that new glorified body. So the spirit is made perfect when you're born again. The process of being renewed takes place in the, in the soul, and the body is waiting for the completeness of its new body when Jesus comes. But you're one body now walking on this planet Earth. Now then, if you don't understand where the problem is in the soulish area, it can create confusion in your life. Thank you, brothers. You may be seated. I want to just kind of take that a little bit further forward if I can. The problem many times simply is this. The stronghold of old thoughts try to prevent new thoughts or new revelation from coming in. Man is made so uniquely. They say that the first time you meet somebody, you have a first impression of them. Then every thought you have of that person after that first impression 
every thought you have tries to reinforce the first impression. You know what I'm saying? And, and so it's just like the thoughts you've had. You don't want to ever... See, nobody wants to believe a lie. Nobody says, I'm believing a lie. <laughs> nobody says that. Everything you believe right now, you believe is true. You believe is accurate. You should, and you should be that way. I mean, I was that way, you know, even when I thought God was a bad guy. Because, but I just was convinced. I just knew I was believing the truth. But it took the Word of God to change that perception, that image I had. But nobody wants to believe a lie. Nobody does say, I'm believing a lie. Everybody thinks they're believing the truth. So it takes something, the Word of God, and first of all, we have to put a value in the Word. Do we really believe that is God's infallible Word? Do we really believe it's the Word of God? That God actually breathed it? Do we really believe that we cannot separate God from His Word? I believe that. I don't believe I can separate you from your Word. One reason why the Word of God is so good, because God good. Your Word good, you good. Your Word no good, you no good. Did I say that? <laughs> That's, that's, how, that's how determined we need to be about even our own word. See, if you will not be a person of your word, you will never believe the word of anybody else, and you'll even question the word of God. You need to be a person of your word. You need to put emphasis upon it. If you say something, do it. Don't give your word if you'll not do it. I learned that by having children. <laughs> you don't tell your kids, yeah, we might do something. They don't know the word might. I mean, my daughter came in one day and said, Daddy, please, can we go to Six Flags? Oh, we might go there. Jeff, she wrote, we're going to Six Flags. They knew if they could get their dad to promise them something, they knew they'd get it. That's the way I trained them. That's the way I taught them. That's the way my Heavenly Father has trained me. That if he said it, man, I believe it. I used to hear some people say, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, honey. God said it, and that settles it. Whether you believe it or not makes no difference. <laughs> God said it. That settles it right there. I want to change my thinking to where I think like he thinks. Because God, I tell you what, he is an all-loving God, all-consuming God. He is a just God. He, he is a, a wonderful Lord God Almighty. Amen. Matter of fact, he's the only wise God. But too many people today, too many Christians are incapacitated. They're taken out of action because they've never learned how to protect their thought life. Just because you have a thought doesn't make you even bad. Let me, I remember Brother Hagin used to make that statement. You can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop the birds from nesting in your hair. Amen. You can't stop thoughts from coming in your mind as far as you're not the originator. He is. But you, that's why you have to take some authority over the thoughts that you have, control what you actually do think upon. Amen. Too many people are incapacitated, taken out of action. Why? Because they have not learned how to control their mind, how to control their thoughts and what they're thinking. Because I tell you what, you've heard the old statement, stinking thinking, need to check up from the neck up, you know, thinking on the wrong things. Why? Because the enemy will try to get you into fear. He'll try to bring impressions to you. Okay, right now let me give you an example. Here in the world, there's a lot of things that's unsettled. In the economy, it's unsettled, okay? In, in peace and in turmoil and war, it's unsettled, okay? And, that, and the enemy wants you to begin to meditate on these things, where you begin to think upon these things. And I can tell you the reason why is this. What you think upon becomes a reality in your heart. Things are conceived twice, first inside you, then outside you. You create it on the inside, and then it begins to be created on the outside. You begin to speak what you believe on the inside. That's why you need to see the Word of God and begin to speak the Word of God, because there is no difference when Jesus spoke the Word of God or when you speak the Word of God. It will have the same effect. What did we hear at the very beginning of the night? We've been creating the likeness and image of God. You're just like God. You're just like your daddy. You're just like your Abba Daddy. You're a chip off the old block. You are just like him. Created just like him. Amen you are. You have to start seeing yourself in a different light. Well, I'm just a worm in the earth. No, you're not either, old worm. That worm died. 
Now you're a child of God, made in the likeness and image of Him. Stand up. Come to a position of attention. Be like your Heavenly Father. Be the person God's called you to be. Don't be whipped. Well, I don't know if I can do it. You're thinking on the wrong things. See, if you think you can do it, you think you can't do it, you're right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We have to see that we are creating in cooperation with the Holy Spirit as we're led by the Spirit of God, led by the Word of God. We are creating, really, our future. You can give up and you can lay down and you can simply die. You could lay down in depression, you could accept depression. Listen, I had to battle that with my son, 40 years old and passed away. And the Bible says we do not grieve as those that have no hope. It doesn't say we don't grieve, it says we just don't grieve the same way they do because they do it with torment. But there was a couple of times when it started to come upon me and I recognized what that was. It was a grieving and I said, no, I will not enter into that. Listen to what I'm saying? Well, how could I do that? Because I was bringing into captivity the thoughts that were coming against me and the imaginations that the enemy is trying to create in my mind because it would control me if I would allow it to. It'll control you if you allow it to. Lack can control you if you allow it to. Depression can control you. Failure can control you. It can create an image inside of you that you see yourself a certain way and you will live out what you see on the inside. If you can see it in here, you can have it out there. Brother Happy Caldwell, he's used this illustration several times, so I'll use it. But when they go to Hawaii sometimes, they, they were standing down and they looked down where this movie star had this big complex, big wall around it, big house, swimming pools, tennis courts, stables for the horse, the helicopter pad, and he said, golly, I just can't ever see myself living in a place like that. And the Holy Ghost said, don't worry, you never will. <laughs> and he said, why not? The Spirit of God said, because you can't see it. How do you see yourself right now? Are you a child of God? Are you more than a conqueror? Are you victorious in the things that God's called you to? You need to begin to do exactly what Samuel's saying and what my sister here on those cards. You need to be speaking a word about yourself. You need to create the image in you who you are. That's the way God sees you. You need to see yourself that way. The devil's trying to hide the word so you'll not see yourself the way God sees you because if he can keep you hid from the truth, he'll keep you in bondage. What's, what's, what's the word say here? Colossians 3, 2 and 3. Set your minds on those things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is now. Everybody say now. now. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When you were born again, you became one with the Lord. Praise God. I love good praise and worship. I hate songs that don't lift Jesus up. I hate songs that tries to create a wrong image. I was listening to one this afternoon because I just love the gentleman. He ministers to me, but in one part, he says, come on, praise, and just bring the Lord down. How are you going to bring the Lord down if I'm in him and he's in me? i got to jump, I guess, on top of the table and jump off. I don't know. <laughs> to get him down, <laughs> he's in me? See, that's an image you need to have of yourself. When I walk out of here tonight, I'm not leaving God inside of a church building. I'm in him and he's in me. I can't walk anywhere. I mean, the Holy Ghost is on the inside. This is the temple of God. Man, I tell you what, I, I, I'm a miracle going someplace to happen. That's my attitude. I'm seeing miracles. Why? Because I expect to. I see it in prayer time and I'm seeing it in the natural. Why? Because I've, I've renewed my mind to where nothing is impossible with God. And since I'm in him, actually nothing's impossible with me when I do what God says to do. Let me chase that rabbit over here a little bit more. I just love that scripture. Anybody has been around, they probably heard me say it. I just, don't you just love the fact that the Lord will never lie to you? How about there in John, the 14th chapter, right-hand page, right-hand column, verse 12 at the very top up there. He says, the things I do, you shall do also, and greater works than these shall you, shall you do, because I go to the Father. 
Do you believe Jesus told you the truth? Okay, now how are you going to do the things Jesus did? Well, you've got to find out how did he do it. Okay, then back up to verse 10. Jesus made this statement. I speak the word, the Father does the work. So how am I going to do what Jesus did? I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to trust God to do the work. His word is his will. You never separate the will of God from God. It, 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 the will of God and the word of God are one. So when I'm reading the word, I'm reading about his will. I don't have to wonder. Did Jesus ever come up to somebody and say, Father, do you want this person healed or not? He didn't ask that. And he actually paid the physical price in his physical body for our physical healing. I don't ever have to ask the Lord, Lord, would you like this person healed? I know he wants them healed. I never have to hesitate. Why? Because I've got my mind renewed. It is the will of the Lord to be healed. Is it the will of the Lord to be saved? Well, the same payment that was made for your, your spiritual, de Jesus' death on the cross, he also paid the price on his physical body, even by the 39 stripes, that you're healed. It's no difference for your healing, it is for your salvation. Same grace through faith brings it into existence. Grace is God's willingness to use his power, might, and ability on your behalf, even though you don't deserve it. And that's God's willingness in your life. So, God wants us healed. I truly believe that. So, your mind is the drawing room for tomorrow's successes or tomorrow's failures. Your mind is. He said what? Set your mind on the things above, not on the earth. Amen. What's it say now in 2 Corinthians 4.4? 4, 4? In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, listen to what he said here. The God of this world, who are we talking about? Satan. Amen? The God of this world system is a better way of, of saying it. The God of this world system hath what? Blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Let me make this statement. You don't really see with your eyes. Your eyes send electrical impulses to the brain. And the brain puts it together in a picture in your mind and you see. Notice the Bible doesn't say Satan blinds the eyes of people. No, he blinds their minds. And how they see themselves how they see God how they understand things and so what does he do he tries to blind their minds now Ephesians 4 17 through 19 which says, with the Lord's authority I say this live no longer as the Gentiles do those without a covenant for they are hopelessly confused their minds are full of darkness they wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds my 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 and they've hardened their hearts against him they have no sense of shame they live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity do you know what he said there he says the person that does not know the lord someone outside the covenant someone not born again he says they're confused their minds are full of darkness they wander far from God. Why? They've had their minds. They've closed their minds. You see, if you can close your mind, you can open your mind. The Spirit of God, when it begins to touch somebody's heart, you are making the decision to resist the Spirit of God or to receive. We all do. We all do. And so here in the Scriptures, he's telling us, I believe, over and over again, we need to be in control of this thought press a thought process taking place in our minds then of course in Philippians 4 8 it says finally brethren what sort of things are true what sort of things are honest what sort of things are just what sort of things are pure what sort of things are lovely what sort of things of good report if there's any virtue if there's any praise think on these things think on the things that are true honest just pure lovely good report now then how much of our day is being attacked with the opposite of what I read there through the news media, through television, through radio, through other people talking to us? And I can tell you right now, a dose of the word once a week in church ain't enough. It's not your pastor's responsibility. It's your responsibility. 
feed yourself. Well, said, I'm just a, 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 I've been born again several years. Well, listen, it's time for you to feed yourself. If you have a child and you feed them, that's understandable. They're an infant. Forty years later and you're still feeding them, you've got a problem. <laughs> listen, folks, let's grow up. Talk to, nudge the person next to you and says, grow up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> now, don't punch them out. I'm going to read you a quote from Bob Gordon. He made this statement. He says, The mind is an actual battlefield in the experience of many people. Lack of mental discipline leads to chaos in the thought life, an inability to discern truth from error, and bondage to an imagination that is able to breed negative ideas and dreams. The enemy uses deliberately devised plan of deceit and lies, attacking our minds with doubtful thoughts, Fear, paranoia, now listen, to erode your resistance. You see, if you succumb to it, if you yield to depression, if I did yield to uh, that turmoil of grieving in a, in a wrong sense, I would have been held captive to it. You hear what I'm saying? What you have accepted in your, in your life in the past, we need to look at everything that's governing our lives today. Is this God's will? Is it God's word? Is this a reflection of God's will? Is it a reflection of God's word? If not, we need to find out what it is. You hear what I'm saying? Why? Because what we are thinking on, what we're meditating on, is being created inside of us. The first time I ever preached... I was asking the Lord for an illustration because, man, I just got a hold of the word of faith. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm just wanting to burn the, turn, the town down. You know what I'm saying? And I was asking one day, I said, Lord, would you give me an illustration that I can, that I can share about how you operate by faith? And this is the only thing the Lord said to me. He said, in the beginning, when I said, let there be light, light was. And this is what he said. I did not say... Oh, is that what it looks like? And I started thinking on that. In the beginning when God said, let there be light, light was God to go, oh, is that what it looks like? No, he didn't do that. It was in here, it was real inside of him, and he spoke out what he was already real on the inside. Don't you understand whether it is scriptural real or if it's unscriptural real, when you begin to speak it out, you're creating it. You've been made in the likeness and image of God. God created everything with words. Did you realize in the beginning of time, words in Genesis was not used really for communication as it was for creation? We're not just communicating with words. We're creating either our deliverances or our bondage. What I'm thinking on is bringing me into captivity or it's liberating me. That's why God says, oh, think upon those things that are true, that are good, a pure, a lovely, a good report. Think upon these things because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are creating it inside of you. The word begins to create an image of you. If you think you've been a loser all of your life, guess what? You're walking it out. That's a lie of the devil, don't you? You're not, they're in a loser in this room. You're in Christ Jesus, you're a winner. <laughs> Every time I say winner, I always laugh because Jerry Savelle one time was preaching the message and he got his tongue tied and he kept saying, you're a wiener, you're a wiener, Jesus is a wiener. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what your mind thinks on, you connect to. Do you see why the enemy has tried to use pornography in the world? To where their mind connects to it. You see, he tries to chart your course to live out what you're looking at. Because he knows you will. God knows it too. That's why he's wanting you to look at his word. See who he says you are. So it charts your course and you live it out. The world says, oh, it's... Recession, taxes, is terrible. Nobody's safe. Everybody's getting a gun. You know, everybody's getting killed. Not me. You know, every, they start 
putting everybody in this box. You know, oh, you got to be afraid of the government. You can't say certain things anymore in church circles, otherwise you might be in trouble. You know, when I read my Bible about the disciples, <laughs> did you know only one disciple did not receive violent death, and it was John? All the others were persecuted. They were either hung, stabbed, flailed with a knife, cut the skin off. You know one reason why John wasn't? Because when Jesus was on the cross, and John was down there with Mary, his mother, and he said, there's your mother, there's your son. John actually took care of Mary all of her life till she died, that he died a natural death himself. But us today, if we get persecuted, if somebody just speaks a little bit bad about us, we get all upset. But listen, there's a persecution, and I'm not preaching, I'm not believing for it. But you can't run from persecution. You can't be quiet because you're afraid of persecution. Because being afraid of a fear will bring it upon you anyway. You hear what I'm saying? What we need is a boldness in the body of Christ that we are God's kids and we're not ashamed of Him. We're not ashamed of who we are. I'm a child of God. I've been recreated in my spirit. I'm being blessed by the Lord. His grace is sufficient in every area of my life. I could go on that one for a while. But in Titus 1.15 says this, The pure in heart and conscience, all things are pure. But the defiled and the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and their consciences are defiled and polluted. That's why we need to be bringing our thought life into control. So what does it say in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5? It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which means limited to fleshly ability. Instead, they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now notice, I'm talking about progression, even, uh, even in the renewing of your minds, it's a process. You progress up and pro in, during this process. Well, this is a process here. It talks about thoughts that are left uncontrolled becomes imaginations. Imaginations let run wild become strongholds. Okay? But the good news is the weapons of our warfare, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the authority we have, can take care of any one of those areas. But, honey, let me tell you something. It's a whole lot easier to take care of it while it's a thought, not an imagination. And it's a whole lot easier to take care of imagination before it ever used to be a stronghold. Because see, when it's a stronghold, it wants to grab you by your nose and pull you around and determine where you're going to go. So what does he say? It starts with thoughts. Bring every thought into captivity. What does that mean? Judge your thought you're having. Is it a godly thought or an ungodly thought? If it's godly, think upon it. Because, see, I have some strongholds in my life right now that are godly. Man, when you think upon something that's good, man, that's a thought. Now you begin to imagine it. You begin to see it in operation, working in your life. And over time, as you meditate that, it begins to be a stronghold in your life. People can't take it away. But it took some time of processing that word, meditating that word, see it in an operation. So thoughts, imaginations, and strongholds, we need those godly ones. The ungodly ones, we need to bring into captivity. Amen. I remember one time I was witnessing to a young man in a factory, and he, he said, oh, don't get talking about the devil. He'll get mad. He'll do something bad on me. And I looked at him. I said, are you really that fearful of the devil? Back in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, it talks about there's a time we're going to look upon the devil, and it, it makes a statement similar to this. It says, we will look narrowly upon him and say, is this the one? who brought people into captivity, who kept people in bondage? Is this the one? You see, you're going to be surprised when you see the devil someday. He's not some big force. Have you ever seen anybody that's been in sin all their life or been sick all of their life? You ever notice how it affects even their physical image? Well, listen, the devil who originated the sin on the earth, who originated the sickness and disease in the earth too, he's been involved in this. It, uh, it's, I believe impacted his visage so much that when you look upon him, you're going to say, 
this little imp? Is this the one that was keeping me in captivity? It'll make you mad. It's better to get mad right now and realize who he is, the oldest loser on planet Earth, and who you are. You're a child of the king. You're a winner. But you have to see him for who he is, but you need to see God for who he is. You need to see you for who you are. Hallelujah. So as I think upon these things, as I meditate upon them, when I have a thought, you said no. I remember driving to church when I was pastoring in Illinois. Uh, my wife and I would be driving to church someday, and I'd be driving along, and I said, no. She said, what? I said, I ain't talking to you. <laughs> what was I doing? I was bringing a thought into captivity. If you've never been a pastor, you don't know what it is right now. You hear this thought, no, Bob, you're at church today. No. <laughs> you know, you have these thoughts you've got to deal with. And so I do it out loud. No. <laughs> what am I doing? Bringing a thought into captivity. Family, I'm not talking to you about a religious calisthenic. I'm talking about a way of life. For you to be beyond the bondages that the enemy wants to get you in that starts in your mind. Spirit, soul, and body. To where that soul, that mind has been renewed, gets an agreement with the spirit, and the body just has to tag along and take it along. Because until that time, it'll just agree probably with the body and the natural things of the life, and the spirit will be held captive because of the power of agreement of the soul and the body. We don't want to get to that place. Amen. So, stronghold of thoughts are trying to reject new knowledge. Turn, please, to James, the first chapter. And I'm going to try to wrap this up. James, the first chapter, verse 23 and 24. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. James 1, 23. It says, For if you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like looking at a, your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. Let me ask you a question. How many of you ever looked at your face raise your hand if you've ever looked at your face raise your hand no you haven't all you've ever done has looked at a reflection of your face in a mirror for you to ever look at your face you'd have to pull your eyeball out and turn around and look at yourself don't try it <laughs> okay so what you've done you've looked at a reflection of your face in a mirror now then you ladies, you look in the mirror. You're making sure one eyebrow is not higher than the other. Your lipstick is on, not running halfway down your chin. Your hair is in place. And if something is wrong, you're going to do something about it. Because you're looking, you're saying, man, that's what's wrong. I can see what's wrong. This ain't a lie. The mirror isn't lying to me. My hair's out of place. You're my eye. Men, we only want to make sure something isn't hanging out our nose, okay? But if it is, we're going to do something about it, okay? Why? Because we see it before us, and we know it's true. If we'll do that with a natural mirror, according to James, should we do it with the Word of God that's a mirror? That we look in that mirror and we see what we look like, and it says, I'm a child of God? I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. So now I'm a temple of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is on the side of me, which is the anointing of God. The Bible says I can do the same things that Jesus did. It says I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. I'm more than a conqueror. I triumph in all things. I'm blessed to whatever I set my hand to. That's what this mirror of the Word is saying about me. Shouldn't I respond to it the same thing, way that I would to a mirror that I look in the bathroom? So I ask you the question again. Do we really believe the Word of God? Do we really believe it is the Word of God? Do we really believe it's God-inspired? Do we really believe it's telling us the truth? I believe there's a corresponding actions to what we believe. But how important are the words of God that He speaks to you? Sometimes you have to hold in your heart some things God will say to you personally for some time. 
You know, Abraham, you know, he waited 25 years for the promised son to come. A lot of times when God will speak to us, we want to see things happen right away. Two years ago, I was going to go to Kenya and South Africa, and I was going over there. And so I called four different pastors to go with me because I like a pastor to go with me. I like for them to experience the mission field, let them get a taste, and try to connect them to some missionaries too. Nobody wanted to go with me because I was gone for three weeks. So God put in my heart a young man that was in my church back in Illinois that, who's now relocated. He's over at Keith Moore's church in Branson, Missouri. And uh, he has his own business. I called him up and said, hey, Paul, you want to go with me to Kenya and South Africa? He said, sure. I said, now, wait a minute. I've been turned down so much lately. Why don't you pray about it? You have to know that God wants you to go. You shouldn't just do something because there's an opportunity. You listening? Opportunity doesn't mean God's will. It just means opportunity. And sometimes we make a sentence out of the word of God. If God says go south, you go to Mexico, he just went, no, I just want you to go south five miles. <laughs> you just missed God by a big, big way. Well, anyway, Paul, he says, yeah, I'll go with you. I said, well, I, I, don't you think you need to pray about it? He said, I don't need to because God told me 20 years ago when I was going to church, when you were my pastor, as I went over the railroad track right down from the church, God told me there's a day coming, Pastor Lon is going to ask you to go overseas with him to minister to ministers. Well, what he doesn't know also that 35 years ago, God gave me a vision, and I haven't had a lot of visions in my life, but that's a vision I had 35 years ago, and it was a vision that I saw myself standing in a tent, and there's this row of black men with white shirts on in front of me. And I've had that in my heart, and I've shared it with a lot of people. Well, we're over there for three weeks. We're going home on Friday. Thursday's the only day we got off, so Wednesday's the last day we're going to be speaking. And that Wednesday at noon, they take me out in the country. I'm standing in a tent, and there's this one row of black brothers in front of me with white shirts on. What I saw 35 years ago came to pass in my eyes. Now, the reason why I share that with you is this. Don't ever let loose of the vision God puts in your heart. Even though it ever seemed to tarry, hold on to it. If God birthed it in your spirit, it's like a woman that's pregnant. She conceives. She doesn't give birth then. It's got to be growing in the womb before it's time to give birth. And in the fullness of time, you give birth. And you want it to be the fullness of time when you do the things that God tells you to do or what he says is going to happen in your life. But don't lose what God put in your heart. Keep it in your heart. Keep it bathed in prayer. Nurture it. Hold that fast in your heart. Don't you ever give up on it. it. Took 20 years for Paul. Took 35 years for me to experience that. But when God speaks to you, write it down. There's things you need to be putting down that God has put in your heart. And you need to, get, you need to have a time when you learned how to get along with God and know his voice. We need a greater sensitivity to the Spirit of God. I was just in a meeting, Brother Jerry, he made this statement. We've become skillful in the presenting of the Word of God, but we've lost some of our sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. We can never lose a sensitivity to the Spirit of God. We're not here to create students. We're here to create disciples, disciplined ones. A student is a person that just receives knowledge. The Bible says knowledge alone puffs up. What's that say? Fathead. We don't need fatheads. <laughs> we need people who will believe the word and live the word and walk the word out day by day. How's that going to take place? By renewing your mind. Constantly renewing your mind. Constantly renewing. So what are we doing in ministry? We're not entertaining people. We're wanting to renew their mind. Why do I use illustrations? So it'll burn in your eyes, in your mind, even the three brothers standing before you when you think about spirit, soul, and body. Because that soulish area is the one that we really need to be working in in our lives. The same measure that you listen and value is the same measure or the value that will come back to you. If you will value what God says to you, if you'll posture yourself to hear God, too many times people say, I'm going to go get with the Lord, and all they do is talk all the time. Stop it. 
Learn to get quiet in his presence. Prayer is communicating with God. There's sometimes you talk, and sometimes you've got to be quiet to listen to him talk. You need to begin to be sensitive to his voice, to what he says. Anybody ever been driving down the highway and you felt like the Lord says, don't go this way? You know what I'm talking about? And you feel like God said, don't go, so you don't go, you go another way? Somebody asked me one time, says, well, why does God do that? Is it because he's protect me from an accident? Well, it could be. Could be a timing issue where he's wanting to get you to a certain place at a certain time. Or could be he just wanting you to learn his voice. What do you do? You obey. Never compromise it. The Bible says you go with joy, but you're led with peace. God will always witness to you his direction by peace in your spirit. He'll bear witness to you. So this is one way you're sensitive to the Spirit of God is recognizing his peace. Amen. To be sensitive to the Spirit of God. I'm trying to wrap this thing up. I got the plane circling the airfield right now. But I can't stop. Just begin to pray in the spirit right now, if you would. Putara makashe poroske, eli poronde shketara mandos. Sendere viseki botadro bolisandros, sibacandro ki batadro belelito, peleando. Judy, I knew when I come here, I had a word for you, hon. I know you've been through a lot this year, but God said I've seen these days from way back beyond. I believed in you, and I put it inside of you. The tenderness of your heart and your desire to follow the Lord is taking this far, but it's going to take you even beyond. There's not a thing you're going to be doing when you minister the word or you minister to people that will fall without God hearing it or God seeing it. Because the things that you preach and the things you minister to others is helping them chart their course in life. You, this is what I heard the Lord want me to tell you, you are a success. You are an obedient daughter. You've done what I've called you to do. You did not run, but you've been in place, and you're going to fulfill the rest of the race. So don't wonder how or don't wonder why. Don't give up and don't even sigh. But let the joy of the Lord rise up from within, and you're going to see many people going to be delivered from the power of sin. You'll see them filled with the Holy Ghost and healed in their bodies and set free by the Spirit of God. It's going to happen because you've heard, you've listened, and you just wouldn't give a nod. But you said, no, Lord, this is what I desire. And the Lord says, yes, that's what I desire. That's why I placed it in your heart. So hold it dear. It'll never depart. Hold it close and watch me fulfill it because my hand is upon you even in a greater portion of grace in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I release that impartation in this temple. <laughs> in this temple. <laughs> oh. Mm. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A mantle came upon you, and it resides there even now. So don't worry about your future, or who, when, or even how. For I'm going to direct your hand, and I'll cause it to come to pass. Relax in me and my daughter. Relax in me. Relax. Mm, relax. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sometimes it, we wonder, how can I do certain things? Let me tell you something. It's by the anointing. I was dealing with a young minister here recently that, that when he wants to pray for people, he'll probably spend 10, 15 minutes with each person sharing every scripture he ever thought of or heard of. And afterwards, the Lord said this to me. He said, he's under pressure to make things happen. He says, you go tell him he needs to depend on the anointing to get the job done. There's sometimes you pray for people, sometimes you just lay hands on them, sometimes you may anoint them with oil, sometimes you just speak a word from a distance. 
But you know what? I do not find any time in the Word of God where Jesus ministered to somebody at deliverance or healing that he was ever long. The anointing. He released the anointing. Now then, do we ever pray long for people? Yes, you do. But that's not the style that you get into when it comes when the moving of the Spirit. That's why a lot of times you see people, somebody just praying, just going down the line, just praying, because it's the anointing. When the anointing's flowing, you flow with it. You hear what I'm saying? Because I'm not against long prayers. But if you think you're getting it done because of the length of your prayer or all the scriptures you said, no, it's the anointing. Jesus could speak to a fig tree. Didn't even worry what it looked like, just walk on. Why? Because he released an anointing by the words of his mouth. They came back the next day that it had withered from its roots. Why? Because something happened when he spoke. I believe when I speak the same way Jesus did, the anointing's doing the work. I was in Guatemala one time, and a man had just been there from England, and he was a, a prophet, they said. I only heard him say one thing, but it registered in my heart. And this is what he said. All things Jesus ever did, Jesus never did. I got to think, wow. What it was, you see, it was the anointing. Jesus never did anything separate from the Holy Ghost. Jesus never said anything. He said, I only say those things I hear my Father say. I only do those things I see my Father do. He worked in cooperation with the Heavenly Father, and he did it because the anointing came upon him. Remember how God anointed Jesus, the Son, with the Holy Ghost and power? He went about doing good and healing all that were pressed of the devil. Well, how God anointed Samuel with the Holy Ghost and power, and he went about doing everything that Jesus did. How God anointed Peter with the Holy Ghost and power, and he went around doing good and healing all that repressed the devil. How God anointed Pastor Elias, and he went around doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil. It's not you, the length of your prayer, how loud you can get, or how you can strain, or peek out of one eye. Why am I sharing that? I've been there. I know what it's like when I first started pastoring to be under pressure that you had to get people healed. <laughs> Listen, line dancing isn't something new. We had it in charismatic circles for years. <laughs> we had the lines lined up over here for deliverance. We had the lines here for healing. We had the lines here for I hope God shows up line. We have a line over here for the depressed line. We have the lines over here for those that just need to be encouraged. And we had all kinds of lines. That was the only way you could have a successful ministry. Lie of the devil. What are we supposed to be doing? Led by the Spirit of God. Led by the Spirit of God. And recognize when there's an anointing being released. There's an anointing being released when you teach the Word. But there's also an anointing released, maybe if you have that prophecy or tongues. But there's also a healing. There's working of miracles. Don't limit God to one area. There is a move of the Spirit in peace. I've seen a move of the Spirit of God just in silence. And everybody was quiet for a half hour. Nobody moved. Nobody even prophesied, gave a message in tongues, or a baby cried. It was a move of the Spirit. We need to welcome the Holy Ghost in to do anything and everything He wants to do. And the congregation has as much a responsibility as the one ministering. Because when we pull on the Spirit of God, we are drawing on the anointing. And we're cooperating together. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Amen, amen. Brother, I don't know you, but I sure appreciate you. A pastor, I'm glad you're here tonight. But I tell you one thing, you've got a good praise and worship here. And this, I felt like the Spirit of God was telling me, make sure you keep it pure. Because it can break the yokes in many people that's in bondage. Now, I don't know, do you have a building? You're leasing a building. Be open. Be open. That song we sung tonight about breakthrough is, 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 is a word that God's given you tonight. Now, it's not only one word, breakthrough. He's also giving you another word. It's called break into. You see, you break through resistance to get into what God has for you. you. God said, I've got a breakthrough for you to also to break into what God has for you. 
And it has to do something about the buildings. I don't know what it is, but I'm just saying what God has in my heart. You just judge it. And if it bears witness, hold it, hold fast to that. But there's a breakthrough for your church to break into what God has had for you for a long time. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So by the renewing of our mind, how important that is that we begin to think like God thinks, that we control our thoughts, that we do not yield to the enemy to control us through wrong thoughts, which creates wrong imaginations, which creates wrong strongholds. Amen? Before I hand over to the pastor, though, was there anybody that needed a physical healing in their body tonight? Anybody here tonight? I'd love to pray for you. And let me say this, anytime, if you do, uh, come up here, I'm going to pray for you. I believe that there's anointing when I minister that I don't even have to have hands laid on them. I believe people get healed during the preaching even. I'll give you an example. We had a young girl about six years of age. It was hard of hearing. Her parents had to raise her voice all the time. Come to church and let their child lay underneath the seats. And one day they was going home. They no longer had to talk loud to their daughter. Her ears were opened. Nobody prayed for her. Nobody laid hands on her, but the anointing of God that was present healed. Keep your faith out there, and let's believe for that. Praise God. Do you need prayer, hon? Didn't speak English? Okay. Well, I tell you, I don't even need to know what else God knows. Amen? So, Father, in obedience to your instruction to pray for those that need healing, I lay my hand as an expression of, of your hand being released upon her body. And in the name of Jesus, be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I trust you, Lord, you're doing the work right now. Lord, heal in her body. Healed, oh, every bit whole. Oh. I'm just thanking you for it, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for her healing. Oh, sweet Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, do you all agree with me that she's healed? Amen. Amen. Why do I confer with my natural body if it can let me down? Well, he'll never let me down Told me I'm healed. Now, there's times we do ask. Brother, ask, does she sense something already taking place in her body since we prayed? No, no? Okay, that's good. That's good. Why would that be good? Because the Bible says when Jesus prayed for some, they went away, and as they went, they were healed. So what we do, we put our faith in the Word of God is working in her. See, if, if you give up because somebody doesn't get something right now, then you miss walking in faith, trusting God's doing the work. Does that upset me? Doesn't upset me? Doesn't upset God? Why? Because I know she's healed. Amen. We're going to hear a good report here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and we were at a home meeting, and, this, and I'm sitting there, we we're singing, and, and I said, is there something wrong with your child? And these people were real spiritual. I said, yeah, we just wasn't going to tell anybody. But uh, the leg is turned inward like this, and he's got a cold. We've got to take him tomorrow, and they're going to put him in a body cast, put that leg up, and it was just a little infant. And I never will forget, I went in there and picked those little legs up, and all we did was say, Father, we thank you, you provided healing for this child in Jesus' name. Let the legs down, didn't look at him, went in the other room. The next day they took him to the doctor, the cold was gone, and his leg was straight. We had one man there uh, that, that was visiting from about 100 miles north, heard we were having some miracles down there, and he had one foot, leg shorter, his heel was about this thick, his sole was about this thick, and never bought a pair of shoes in his whole life just from a store. And I remember holding his legs, just letting them, and all of a sudden, man, those things just started going back and forth, and all of a sudden, they lined up perfect. He got up for the first time in his life, stood flat-footed. Well, being on a farm, nobody had a size 13 foot. We went out and put it in a machine shed, put it in a vise, took a hammer and chisel, and cut the bottom of his sole off and the heel off so he could walk level. Went and bought his first pair of tennis shoes in all his life. He worked in an office, went to the office on Monday, put his feet up on his desk and crossed his legs because he wanted everybody to see his feet. Listen, how did that happen? The anointing. 
the anointing. You can't strain enough. You can't pray hard enough. You ain't worthy enough. No, it's, it's the anointing. And anyone can flow in it. Pastor, God bless you.